Father, we thank you so much for this time this morning that we can gather here in your house, God, to uh, serve you, to worship you, to hear your word, and Lord, to give uh, as you have commanded us to do. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless the giver this morning. Lord, bless them abundantly. Lord, let it come back to them uh, uh, in many different ways. And so, God, we thank you for this. We ask you to bless it, multiply it, and help us to put it to good use for kingdom's work in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, you know what we're going to say right now. Uh, we've been saying it for the whole year, and I'm not going to stop, at least until the end of the year. So I want you to lift up your Bibles, your, your iPads, your iPhones, whatever you use, and say this after me. Say, this is my Bible. In it are 66 books. They're written by 40 different authors. It's God's owner's manual for my life. Its words are God-breathed and God-inspired. And if I read it every day, it will change my life. It will transform me into the image of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I choose to love it and cherish it all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now turn to the person next to you and say, read your Bible every day. Amen. So I'm noticing that we still have quite a few gone uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday and uh, looking forward to having them back next week. But uh, I, I'm going to start a new series uh for those of you who weren't here last week, we finished up our Book of Ezekiel series, and uh, I recommend you pick up one of the handouts. Can we put up that first slide that says the way, please? Yeah. And uh, so pick up one of the handouts that we handed out last week of the, the temple, the pictures of the temple and stuff, stuff like that, so you can go home and listen to last week. It's important that you hear the last uh, message that I taught in the book of Ezekiel. And uh, you could uh, listen to it on our website or you can listen to it on YouTube. It's on Rumble and it's on iTunes. And so you should pick that up on your way out this morning. Go over and review because it will show you the last four uh, chapters out of the book of Ezekiel. Today I I'm starting a new series as I said, titled The Way. The Way. Turn to somebody and say, The Way. In John 14, 6, Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples, and he was letting them know that he was going away, speaking of going back home to heaven. However, they thought that he was perhaps going to another city or another community to do some more ministering to people. And uh, Thomas said, Lord, we do not where, know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Thomas asked that question to the Lord, and Jesus answered him in John 14, 6. If we can pull that slide up, and then Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen, church? And he says, no one can come to the Father except through me. And those of us that have been born again, that have Jesus Christ living in our hearts, we understand that the only way to get to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the bridge uh, uh, from, from earth to heaven, from, from our, our, our negative old man that we once were to the new man, the born again man in, 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 in God, because God has made his home inside of us. He has made his abode in us, and we are now uh, called the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? And so Jesus is the bridge that gets us to God. You can't go to, you can't get to God unless you go through Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except by me. So with this in mind, and being the key verse that unlocks the door to this series that we're going to be in, we're going to be exploring exactly what Jesus is saying to Thomas 
and to us as well. And so Thomas, he was thinking that Jesus was just going to the, another earthly place, as I said, another city or village somewhere near where they were at that particular time. But remember what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say that he would show us the way. He said, I am the way. Amen, church? He didn't promise to teach us the truth. He said that he is the truth. Jesus didn't offer us the secrets of life. He said that he is the life. And so without a way, uh, we, we just meander through life aimlessly, don't we? Before we knew Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we just meandered around aimlessly without hope in our lives. And without the truth, there's no knowing. And some people believe uh, just about anything because they have no truth. They haven't met the truth maker yet. And without life, we have no hope, no surety in what happens after this life. We were hopeless. We weren't sure whether we would go to heaven or go to hell or, or, or come back as a giraffe. I know that's what you were hoping that you would come back at instead of a, a dirty old rat or something like that, right? But you didn't know the way, the truth, and the life because you didn't meet Jesus uh, until that happened. Then you knew those things, that he was the way, he is the truth, and he is the life that we are to follow. And so during this series, I'm going to assume that everyone in here has already met Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. And in case you're watching online and you have not received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, uh, I pray that in these teachings that you'll make a commitment to give your life over to Jesus Christ. And maybe there is somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ. But I pray also for you that during this series, even today before you leave here, that you'll make a commitment to give your life over to Jesus Christ and make Him not only your Savior, but your Lord as well. Amen? And so in this series, uh, we're going to be looking at several key factors that one must pursue during the journey that you and I are on, the journey of life that we have chosen to embark on with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so this series is designed to lead us into something that we have done every January over the existence of the church, of the Heritage Church. And, uh, that, and that is, is that we began each year with fasting and praying. And so over the years, we have committed to 21 days of, of, of prayer and fasting. But this year, the Lord was uh, kind of stirring something in me. Uh, over the last month or so, and I felt that we should do seven days of prayer and fasting in January this year. And so today I'm going to begin to outline the seven things that we're going to be doing for those seven days of prayer and fasting. You wonder why? How, Pastor Jim, why, why only seven days? Well, I, I think that, that you'll, I hope that God will reveal to you what He has revealed to me. Uh, and that we're going to be practicing and participating in for seven days in the month of January. So it's important for everyone to understand that fasting is simply refraining from food for spiritual purposes. Biblically speaking, fasting has always been a normal part of a relationship with God the Father. People, if you look through your Bible, people have fasted throughout the text. And the reason they did was to draw closer to God, to get answers from God, to move in and get breakthroughs and find out what God would have them to do. And so when you eliminate food from yourself for a day or even 8 to 12 hours if you do partial fast, your spirit, you see, then becomes uncluttered from the things of this world, and it, it becomes deeply sensitive to the things of God. David describes in the 42nd Psalm, verses 1 and 2, if you go to that slide, he said, As a deer pants for the flowing streams, so pants my soul 
for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So David's hunger and his thirst that we see here when we read that text for God was greater than his desire, you see, for the things of this world. That's what he's saying. Greater than food, greater than pursuing things of this world. But his pursuit then was for the Lord God himself. And as a deer pants for flowing streams, or some of your texts might read, as a deer pants for water, so pants my soul for you, O God. That's how all of us should feel. My soul thirsts for God and for God alone. Amen, church? And so once you've experienced this kind of intimacy with the Lord, uh, there are countless blessings that follow that. And your entire perspective will change. Uh, You will soon learn that prayer and fasting is the key thing that unlocks the door to a deeper relationship with God. It's the key thing. And so we will be looking at nine things that will help modify your character. Because that's what God wants to do. He wants to modify your character with the Word of God. Amen, church? And so in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it mentions nine things that are character-building fruits. Uh, they're very important to me. I, 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 I haven't got them dialed in yet in my life, but I'm working on it. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. We're going to read that text this morning. And here's what it says. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality is going to name some of those sinful things that our flesh wants to participate in. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the thing, and things like these. And he goes on to say, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You need to underscore that in your Bible. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Hallelujah. I want to pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. God, I just ask you that we open our ears and our hearts to receive what you have for us today as we uh, teach and learn and and uh, glean from what the Scripture has to say. So, the Apostle Paul, in these verses that we just read, he, he exhorts us to live and to walk in the Spirit. And we all know man was created by God as a living spirit, created by God and so that we could have fellowship with God. That's what God, why God created us so that we could have fellowship with Him. You remember the story about Adam and Eve in the garden, that they used to walk, Adam would walk with God in the cool of the day, and then when he partook of the apple and fell to sin, he hid from God because he knew he had done something wrong against God's will. And God, he thought he could hide from God, but none of us can hide from God, amen? And God said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? You know, he was wanting to walk with him in the garden and have fellowship with him. And uh, 
and, and he and Adam was uh, covered with the fig leaf, him and his wife Eve, right? Because they partook of sin, and now they were in the sin nature of God. And they knew that once you uh, are uh, in sin, it separates us from God, and we can't have fellowship with God at that point. Have you ever? Uh, you don't have to answer this, but anyone who has ever, whether you're born again or not, and for some reason you fall into some kind of sinful thing in your life and you participated in for a while, uh, you can't be fellowshipping with God while you're participating in that sin. It just doesn't work that way. You have to repent of the sin that you're involved in with a heartfelt repentance and humble yourself and then you can reconnect your relationship with God. But you, you can't have a relationship with God. You're fooling yourself uh, if you're participating in sinful acts. Uh, at least you, you, you think you, that you might be, but you're not. How many of us don't know people that living a sinful life and they, they say, I'm a Christian? Well, they're not a Christian because they're not living according to what the Scripture says a Christian could live by should live by. Amen? So, Paul, he's exhorting us to live and to walk in the Spirit. And God, we all know that God is our Creator and that God created uh, mankind. Amen? And He created us as spirit beings so that we could have fellowship with Him. God is the superior Trinity and man is the inferior Trinity. The superior trinity is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The inferior trinity is made up of spirit, soul, and body. That's us. And so, it, it's in the realm uh, of the spirit where man meets God. That's where we meet God. It's in the spirit realm. Of things. You can't meet God, as I, I just said a little while ago, if you're participating in the flesh, God's not going to deal with you, especially if you know that it's wrong. If you're a Christian and you're, you fell to sin, there's no participation, there's no interaction with God until you repent of that. And that's the place where uh, we come in touch with God, is in this spiritual realm that God created. And that's where God touches you and I. That's where God communicates with you and I. In our spirit, in our spirit man, in the realm of the spirit, that's where communication with our Lord takes place. And in that place, His superior spirit, the Bible says, bears witness with our spirit, our inferior spirit. And that's how we know that we are children of God, because we're communicating our spirits are bearing witness with one another, and we're communicating with God. And oh, God, man, I love that time with God. And that's how we know that we're children of God, because our spirit bears witness with His spirit. You guys tracking with me on that? So in John four twenty four, the Bible says, "God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth." And when Adam sinned, you guys, uh, his spirit died, just as God warned him in the book of Genesis, Genesis that it would. I want, to, I want us to look at that verse in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Here's what it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God warned him that spiritually he would die, and he still participated in it. Adam broke fellowship with God, and his spirit died that day. Now listen to me very carefully, because God will not fellowship with a person who is dominated by their flesh. It just won't happen. And that's exactly what Adam's temptation led him to, was his fleshly domination. He saw, the Bible says, that the, the, the tree was pleasant. It looked good. He, he saw all the fruit that was on the tree. That it must be tasty fruit. Man, it looks so good. It's got to taste really good, too. And so, 
it would make him wise, the Bible said, that the devil spoke to him and said, it's not only good to eat, but it'll make you wise as God. And so, man, how could you go wrong? That's the temptation that he was tempted with, even though God said that was a forbidden fruit. That's being led by the flesh when we fall over and cross that line uh, from the spirit to the flesh. Then you're being led by the flesh. First John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So, in Adam and Eve's case, they ate and the flesh began to rule, and ever since then, man's consciousness has been filled and absorbed with the desires of fleshly appetites. Ever since then. And so God never intended man to live this way. That was not His intent. He created us so that we would have this pure, holy fellowship with Him, communicate with Him in the spirit realm. And it was not intended for man to live by the flesh because living by the flesh alienates us from God who is spirit. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, says the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Let me try to explain that to you, if you're, if you're not familiar with that passage. The person who is spiritual, the person that is born again, I'm not talking about some guru or maharishi, uh, that's not the spiritualness that this Bible is talking about. It's talking about a born again believer. That is the person who understands the Word of God. But the person who is not born again does not have spiritual discernment because he does not have the Holy Ghost living inside of him. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Because when you get born again, the Holy Spirit makes his home in you. The Bible says that his love has been shed abroad in our hearts. And so if the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and he's living inside of you, then you are able, when you read your Bible and you pick up your Bible, then you're able to discern, you're able to understand what it says. How many of us, before we got saved, would pick up a Bible and you probably started at Genesis 1-1, amen? And you started reading through Genesis 1-1 and man, you said, this is boring stuff. doesn't make sense. So you put it down and uh, you put it away and you never picked it up again, perhaps. And because you did not have the Holy Spirit in you, you weren't able to discern what it is. And then one day you got born again, and you began to read the Bible, and all of a sudden everything starts making sense. Because the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is able to communicate to you in that spirit realm, and now you're able to have fellowship with God because this is God's living Word. It's His written Word. It's alive. He breathed it into existence for you and I to be able to have fellowship with Him. Amen? And so, the person who's spiritual is a person who's, who's born again and he understands the Word of God. But the person who is not born again does not understand the Word of God because he cannot spiritually discern it because he does not have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of him. Uh, that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, I'll say it again, you must be born again. I've said this before. Now, you, you hear me use that phrase, born again, all the time. I don't, like, say, use the term Christian very often when I'm teaching or expressing or talking about the body of Christ. Because many people claim to be Christians. And, but the Bible says that you must be born again. So I reference people that are truly born again as born again Christians. Or they're born again. Now the time that I've spent in Africa, I've shared this with you, they don't even use the word Christians. They call people 
they'll say, he's a born again, or she's a born again. So that you know that that person knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They don't say they're, they're, he's a Christian. Because there's all kinds of weird people in, throughout the nation, our nation and the world, that call themselves Christians and they're not born again. So Jesus said, you must be born again. And so it's pretty amazing, isn't it, the difference uh, from being born of the Spirit and how, how much difference that really makes in our life. In my attitude towards life changed when I got born again. And in my understanding of the Word of God and in so many other things, my attitude changed. I now have a clear, better understanding of, of everything. And, and so, than I did before, I knew Jesus Christ. How about you? Turn to somebody and say, I do. And so, suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, uh, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we're born of the Spirit. Just like that. Boom. And things suddenly become illuminated. Uh, how, how many of you had this experience or you heard somebody's testimony that said, man, when, when I got saved, it felt like a ton of weight was lifted from my shoulders. Amen? In the twinkling of an eye, just like that, boom. You, you become illuminated. The Lord comes in and all the things, the heaviness of the world and all the things that have brought you down for so long, they just slowly dissipate from you. Amen? And so the things that once were a mystery that we couldn't understand are now understandable. They are revealed by the Spirit because uh, we have the truth of God now living in our hearts, you guys. Amen? And Paul exhorts us to walk in the Spirit. That means to walk in fellowship with God every single day. Walking in the Spirit means that you're having fellowship with God. You wake up in the morning and say, Thank you, Lord, this is the day that you have made. I choose to be glad in it. I choose to be happy in it. And as you go through your day, you can have conversations with God. You can stay in touch with God when you're working, when you're at school, when you're sewing at home, when you're cooking, or whatever. I can't tell you how much, and I learned this from my wife, that just throughout my day, I communicate with God. It's just a habit. Uh, during the summer... I was fishing, and I had my GoPro on the, on the boat, and I'm fishing, and I'm videoing myself catching these fish, and when I listen to the, to the video, I can hear myself talking to God. Oh, God, help me get this one in. This is like a good, oh, Jesus, help me, Jesus, you know? And it just, it's just a natural thing that you develop, and that's called walking in the Spirit. You're walking with God. He's your friend. You talk to Him all throughout your day. Are you guys with me on that? So Paul exalts us to walk in the Spirit and have fellowship with God. That's what that is. Walk on the spiritual side of yourself, not on the fleshy side. And if, and if you do, you'll, be, you'll fulfill the, the desires of your flesh. I mean, you'll, you won't fulfill them. You'll, you'll, this, they will dissipate because you're walking with God. The two can't mix. And we need to understand that. The flesh will not be ruling over you any longer. When it comes, you'll recognize it like that, and you could, you could shut it down that quick. But instead, your life will be dominated by the Spirit instead of by the flesh. Amen? And so, Galatians chapter 5, let's look at this again, verses 16 and 17. It says, But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Are you guys tracking with me so far? And so the next four verses, Paul warns us about the many sinful things. Uh, that our flesh wants us to participate in. Uh, and at the end of those verses, Paul says this. He says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
list of all, all these sins. And those that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to leave that up to you to search it out and find out for yourself. Amen? And in verses 22 and 23, Paul gives us a list of these nine things known as the fruit of the Spirit. And here is what it says. It says, but the fruit, notice it's singular. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Notice that the fruit of the Spirit, as I said, is singular. And that's because there is only one real fruit of the Spirit, and the real fruit of the Spirit is love. You see? These other words define the true agape love. So, the fruit of the Spirit, singular, is love. And all the other things, uh, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, uh, goodness, and long-suffering, or self-control, uh, they all fall in and are part of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. It's like when you break open a pomegranate and you see all these different seeds in there, Right? Well, when you break open love, it should look like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what love looks like. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. And all these things that, that he mentions afterwards, all of eight of those things are part of that fruit. Are you with me, church? So if we operate in love, all these other things are a, a description of what true agape love is. The other eight words, like I said, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, are describing what love in action looks like. That's what love looks like. I, I want to give you a brief description of how the word love was translated by the ancient Greeks in that ancient language where uh, they had four distinct, distinct words for love. If you go on that next slide, I think they're on there. It says, uh, the first word is eros, which was the word used to describe a romantic, passionate kind of love. When you fall in love with somebody. The word that they used for, for love, that kind of love was the word eros. And number two on there is phila. That's where we get our, our, our word Philadelphia from, and Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. Are you with me? And it says, Phila was the word which describes brotherly love. And that includes friends as well as brothers and sisters in Christ. So when I say in an email, I love you, that's Phila, Philia love, meaning I love you in the Lord. I don't eros you. I want I, I eros my wife. That's romantic or passionate love. I don't I, I feel o you, but I don't eros you. Are you with me? So storge is the next one on the list. Is the word for the love that shows itself in affection and care for our family. So here again, there's there's another kind of love. Storge, and so this is. I love my children. I love some of my friends. This is storge love. I love my family. That's the kind of love that storge describes. And then, of course, number four is agape love. But agape describes a, a different kind of love. It, it, it is a love more of a decision that we make that chooses to love those that are undeserving. We choose to love them even though, you know, our flesh doesn't want to love them. They, they stink. They don't look good. I don't like the way they talk. I, I don't like anything about them. I don't want to be around them. I can't love them. Well, agape love is the kind of love. It's unconditional love. And it describes, the basic description is that it causes us to love the undeserving people we would normally not love. 
And so agape has to do with the mind, our mind. It's not just an emotion, but a principle by which we choose to live by. Agape love is unconditional love, and it loves even when the person, as I said, is undeserving of it, and it's the unconditional love that flows from the heart of Jesus who loved us when we did not deserve to be loved by Him. Amen? He loved us he, he, before you were even born. He loved you, and He went to the cross, and He died on the cross of Calvary, this horrible death, because He loved you with this agape kind of love, unconditional love. Isn't that wonderful? And so this is the love of the Spirit, and it is the fruit of the Spirit. Because agape kind of love is unconditional love. And it is something that we need to determine that we're going to live by and live with in our mind and our heart that we will live by this kind of love. That that's how we're going to live. We need to make that determination in our mind and say, God, help me to understand and show me what true agape love looks like so that I can live by it. And the other eight things like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control become fruit that we bear in our life because we are living our life in agape love. Remember, Jesus said you will know them by their fruit, right? So when we live a life and we determine in our own mind and in our heart that we're going to live in this fruit called agape love, then we bear all this other good, all these other good things and, and, and people will know us by our fruit. Today is an introduction to the series uh, titled Practicing the Way, the Truth, and the Life. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be preparing for January and the seven days of prayer and fasting in which you will pick any seven days out of the month of January to do this fasting on. They can be consecutive days, or they can be a day here or a day there, as long as there's seven days out of the month. You can do two days in a row, however you want to do it. It's up to you. Uh, spread them out through the month or however. And my hope is that we will take this very seriously, and it will help you. That's the whole idea of it, is to help you. It will help you be. Because fast by fasting, we need to understand this, at the beginning of the year sets a course for your entire year. Let me give you a biblical example of what fasting can do for you and your family. There's a story in the Bible in Acts chapter 10, you, you should read that chapter when you get time, about when Simon Peter was summoned to or a, a Caesarea by an Italian soldier by the name of Cornelius, who served in the Roman uh, military. And at this time, Simon Peter was fasting, and he was praying on the rooftop of the house in the city of Joppa. And the Lord gave him a vision of, of the heavens opening up and, and something coming down that looked like a sheet and uh, when the sheet came down and, and dropped from heaven, and when it opened up, there were all kinds of these animals that were in the sheet, birds and uh, reptiles and uh, all kinds of things. And Simon Peter, uh, the, the Lord told Simon Peter to rise and kill them and eat those animals. And Peter, being a good Jewish man, he said, by no means, Lord, he doubted the Lord. He said, by no means, Lord, I never have eaten anything common or unclean in my entire life. And a voice came to him and said, what God has made clean, do not call unclean or common, Peter. Peter, at this time, actually doubted the vision that he saw from God. He doubted it. So then... There was another man by the name of Cornelius, as I said, who was fasting and praying because he was in Caesarea and he's fasting and praying because he didn't know God and he wanted to know God and he wanted his entire family to know God. And 
God then sent an angel to Cornelius, and after he was fasting for three days, the Bible says that the angel said, God has heard your prayers, Cornelius, and it has come up as a memorial to him. And he said, uh, Cornelius, uh, I want you to take three men and I want you to send them to Joppa because in Joppa there's a house and he told them how to get there. And he said, I want you to go to Joppa and you, you'll meet a man by the name of Simon Peter. And he will be there. And the Bible says that Cornelius sent these three men to the house in Joppa where Simon Peter was praying and fasting. And the three men arrived and they summoned Peter to go with them to Caesarea where Cornelius was. And he was in this house with his family and friends. Family and friends were there with him. And the Holy Spirit came while Peter was talking to them about the Word of God. The Holy Spirit came, the Bible says, and fell on him, Cornelius that is, and his on his entire family and all their friends that were in the house, and Cornelius and his whole house were saved that day. So if you take this seriously, what we're going to participate in, in these seven days of prayer and fasting, that's one thing I will claim for you, that the Holy Spirit will fall on you and your house, and everyone in there will be saved your children, your grandchildren, and whatever uh, kin folks you may have, I'm going to believe God with you that they're going to get saved. Because I want you and them to experience this agape love, agape love. That they will come to know Jesus and the power of His agape love. And the other thing that I want you to know is that I'm going to claim for you is that the vision that God has given you will be renewed. He gave Peter a vision, that uh, the sheet that came down from heaven. Peter, Peter doubted it. Maybe you've been doubting the vision that God gave you, whatever that was, and whatever it was. Maybe you've been doubting that vision. And I'm going to be praying for you, and I'm going to be standing with you, that God will, that vision will be renewed, and you will not doubt the vision anymore. And that's the two things that I'm getting in my spirit while I was preparing this. For you, your house, to be saved. And don't doubt the vision. Don't doubt it anymore. Habakkuk 2.3 says this. It says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Wait for it. Because it will surely come it will not tarry. There'll be a day when the vision shows up in God's perfect timing. You've got to wait for it. Don't doubt that it, it, oh, it's not coming to pass. It was just some pipe dream that I had in my head. You've got to fight off those lies from the devil when they come to you. And you've got to believe God that that vision that you had came from God and that it will come to pass. Though it tarries, wait for it, the Scripture says. One thing I've learned when you fast and pray is that you get clarity and you get vision. And when you fast, God will give you clarity and He will give you vision. Now, I'm going to take a minute just to talk to you about, you, you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I can't fast because I'm diabetic or I need this or I, I have to have my medications or whatever it may be. But you can do some kind of fast. You can do something. You can give up some foods that you really love for a day. Come on. Right? You can even maybe not eat for a half a day, skip breakfast and lunch, and just eat dinner that day. You can do something, can't you? So I want to encourage you that you don't have to just drink water all that day, uh, as some of us do and not have anything that day, but you can do something. You can do something. God will get you through the day. I don't care if you work hard all day or not. God will get you through it. I've done it done it for years. Working 12-hour days and just sipping on water all day. You can do it. And you need to take this seriously 
because God will honor what you're doing. We just don't do this for some religious thing that we do every year. We do it because I want and God wants you to be helped in several ways in your life. I want you to get a breakthrough in your life. I want you to get a healing in your life. I want you to your finances to get in line in your life. I want you to be healed and whole and set free from any bondages that may have you down. Are you with me, church? So this series is about the way, the truth, and the life. And it's all about the things that we practice or believe in as Christians. But understanding that these things don't automatically transform our character. Just because you believe that the Bible is true, it doesn't mean that it transforms your character and makes you a different person. I know people have been call themselves Christians for for years, much longer than me. But man, they 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 got some big character flaws because they never. Uh, uh, allow the Word of God to come into their heart and change their heart concerning certain things about the type of person they are. And so it's all about the things we practice and we believe as Christians, but understanding that these things don't automatically transform our character. They don't. Many times there is a disconnect uh, from what we believe in our heart and we need something to bridge that gap. But there's this disconnect that happens. And what bridges the gap for us is this, what I'm calling agape, this agape love that has been shed abroad in our hearts. That's what bridges the gap to everything. Unconditional love of Christ who, who died this horrible death on the cross at Calvary for you and I. So you and I could have a way, know the way, He's the way, Know the truth. He's the truth. And live the life. He's the life in Jesus Christ. Amen, church? The unconditional love of Christ who died on this horrible death on the cross for Calvary for a bunch of sinners like me and you. He wants us to get up and move forward with our life. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been around. God loves you and He made a way for you. He is the way. Amen? Have you ever been asked by someone this question? Why don't Christians act out or live by what they believe? If you haven't been asked that question, you, you probably will before you leave this earth at some point. Why don't Christians, I've asked myself that question about a lot of people. Why? They claim to be a Christian, but why don't they act out the way they say they believe? Why? We need to understand that what we say we believe about the Bible and what we say we believe about Jesus should be exemplified by our character. The kind of man I am, the kind of person I am, the kind of woman you are, the kind of woman you are with your kids and in your home. Amen? Uh, so our belief in Jesus should impact our character traits. It should change us. Amen, church? We see we need to be marked by this agape love with the fruit of the Spirit falling off of our tree every single day, splashing on other people all around us so that they will know and say, he's a born again. She's a born again. Because the fruit of the Spirit, they, it can't be denied. Because we're living in uh, this agape love. And so if you're like me, I haven't got there yet. I need help. And that's why I believe the Lord has put this series and these seven days of prayer and fasting on my heart this year. So with that in mind, let's just get ready because Jesus is coming soon, you guys. And, and we shouldn't have this disconnect between what we believe and the way we live our lives. Shouldn't be disconnected. Should be one the same. And so, if you agree, let me hear you say amen this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that it goes forth and it does not return void. Father, I thank you 
for these that are here this morning and those that are watching online. And Lord, if there be anybody here or listening online that does not know you personally, Lord, I, I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes and say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I love you, but I'm a sinner. I've failed in so many ways. And I need Jesus to forgive me of all my sin. So, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me whole. Make me pure. And, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for those sins. And I believe that you rose on the third day to give me new life in you. So I ask you to come into my heart now. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I receive you now in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you said that prayer for the first time or you have been in a backslidden state, you can come up and see me afterwards. I have some literature for you. If you're watching online and you said that prayer with me, uh, if you can contact me at info at heritage-church.org. That's info at heritage-church.org. And let me know that you said that prayer. And I will send you some information that will help you in your growth in Jesus Christ. And uh, if you don't live in this area, I'll try to find a good church for you in the area that you live where you can connect at. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Remember, this is the day that the Lord has made choose to rejoice in it. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much.